Right. Hello, everyone. It is Friday. It is 2 p.m. in the UK, which means that we start our Friday forecasting talks. My name is Ivan, and uh, I'll give you a brief introduction of uh, uh, the center that organizes these talks. And uh, here is a slide with all the center members, current center members that we have at the moment. So one of those uh, members will be presenting today. That's Stefan Colasa. But you see that we have uh, well, uh, 12, 12 um, academics that have a variety of interests. And based on our interests, we provide a variety of services, bespoke short courses, consultancy, summer projects. We help in developing software to companies. And we have expertise in a variety of areas, including marketing analytics, supply chain forecasting, uh, inventory management, forecasting and planning, and so on. Um, before we move to the, the further discussion of how you can get in touch with us and so on, I would like to say a couple of words about the survey that is being um, organized by our PhD student, Carlos Rodriguez, uh, under supervision of Sven Krohn and Anna Lina. So Carlos is trying to understand what is the state of forecasting in demand planning, and he needs your help if you are uh, involved in demand planning in one way or another. So we would really appreciate if you could uh, answer several questions in the survey. It shouldn't take more than 10 minutes of your time. So the survey shouldn't take more than 10 minutes of your time. Uh, please do have a look at it. And there is a LinkedIn link. So if you can share it with your uh, friends, colleagues who might find it relevant, it would be great. Because what we are trying to do, we are trying to understand what people use in practice, how they use those things and so on specifically in forecasting. Okay, and a couple of words about the center. You can get in touch with us, keep in touch with us using lots of different ways. We are on Twitter, Lancaster CMF. We are on, on LinkedIn. Uh, you can send us an email directly. We have an amazing new website uh, developed by uh, our, our great intern and uh, under my supervision. We have a YouTube channel where we publish these videos, plus we are now releasing educational videos. And stay tuned. Um, at some point, hopefully in a month or so, we will have a new video delivered by the very same Stefan Colasa, who will be talking today. And finally, we have a landing page of Friday Forecasting Talks, where we publish all the relevant information to these events. If you um, feel a bit lazy following these links, typing them and so on, you can scan this QR code and it will lead you directly to the page with all the options uh, related to CMOF. Well, that's actually it from me. So let's move to our presentation and our speakers. Today we have Stefan Kolasa Bachman, Rustam Tabar, and Anna Simpson, and they will be talking about common forecasting methods and the mindset behind forecasting. All right, so, well, hi, everybody. Uh, really delighted to be here. My name is Bahman, and I'm a reader uh, at Cardiff Business School, Cardiff University in the UK. Um, I'll pass it to uh, Stefan. Uh, sorry. Uh, thank you, Bahman. Thank you, everybody, for being here. I'm Stefan Kolasa. I'm a data science expert at SAP in Switzerland. Um, Anno, over to you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Great pleasure to be here. Thank you for joining. My name is Enno Siemsen, and I'm a faculty member at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, Enno, would you like to provide like a background to the book before we go through the presentation? Maybe? Yeah, sure. Um, so th th the presentation today is based on, on our book, which has just been released in, in print, and it's available for free online. Um, you can see the, the link over there. And um, really, this goes back almost 10 years ago um, when, you know, I, I kind of observed that there were plenty of forecasting books out there and uh, very good technical books, but um, there's a large audience that uh, was particularly relevant for executive education um, of people who, who are not technical and who don't necessarily have a technical background but who have to deal with forecasts. And um, so I, I felt we needed a book which is more written for that audience. So I approached Stefan uh, probably somewhere around 2014 uh, and asked him whether he 
he wanted to write a book with me and and that became a book called demand forecasting for managers which has been out for a while um really sort of targeted at at a managerial audience and um roughly in 2020 bachman approached us and and said well i i really like your book which you know it's always good to hear as an author and um and basically said we, we need to do two things we need to update the book because a lot of things have happened in the field of forecasting uh, since we wrote the, the first version of the book. Um, you know, machine learning has become a lot more useful and uh, we um, really have to add a couple of topics. And uh, second, we have to make it available for free. And so um, <laughs> uh, as authors, you know, you you don't really earn a whole lot of money from your book anyway. So you're like, okay, great. Let's make it available for free so you can share it. You can use it in your um, uh, faculty, can more easily use it in classes. Uh, executives can share it with their teams, right? So um, that led to this version of the book. And, and really the key idea of the book is to, again, make forecasting accessible for an executive audience, right? There's a lot of people out there who don't have technical training but have to make decisions based on forecasts and there's so many things that can go wrong um, with that so we wrote the book with that audience in mind Bahman, next slide wonderful uh thank you Eno. Uh, so based on the the book actually we have uh, this agenda for today uh, we start by talking about why we do forecasting in the first place and why it is important for planning and decision making processes and then we uh, go through the different steps in the forecasting workflow to produce the forecast to inform the decisions uh, we present a simple example of how forecasts are are produced and communicated as well uh, and then we talk about an important aspect of the process which is about the data and why uh, we need to know data and to do what with actually that um, and following that we look at the uh, some aspect of data quality that are important for forecasting and then we discuss about um, a range of different forecasting methods we don't go into detail of the methods we just show you what are the different ranges from simple to more uh, complex and then also discuss our recommendation and how to build forecasting models uh, following that we look at the forecast quality evaluation and also discuss what uh, attributes you need to have uh, for a uh, like an ideal forecaster in your team. Um, so in addition to like the technical part of the process, we also discuss the organizational part of it. And then finally, we uh, cover some things in terms of when forecasting may fail. We start the book with um, uh, the, the presentation today here with, with sort of just a a, a bit of a sense for why forecasting is important and and maybe for this audience this is this is sort of fairly obvious right but i i've run into this quite a bit in my career doing executive education and consulting where where people will say why do we even bother with forecasting right forecasts are always wrong um can't we just switch to a business model where we don't need forecasting and and that sounds very tempting um but it is, I think, utterly impossible, right? Uh, someone in your supply chain will have to forecast. Sure, you can you know, move to sort of uh, quick response and, and faster uh, 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 lead times with your suppliers, but that usually means that that puts a heavier burden on your suppliers to do the forecasting. Um, you can move to a pull system, but you know that usually means you have sort of an implicit forecast of things becoming relatively stable. So th th there is, a, I think, a, uh, a need in every organization to do forecasting, and that's important to emphasize. There's really no way around it. You might as well uh, explicitly tackle the, pro uh, the problem, right? So um, somebody in the supply chain has to forecast and um, you know forecasts are in incredibly important um, for any decision making any planning and but forecasting doesn't have to be complex right i think we have seen an explosion in, in methods in forecasting um, 
you know, particularly in the past five years, I think the the, the complexity of these methods has increased significantly. Um, but very simple methods actually work quite well. I think there's a lot of low hanging fruit where, um, you know, if you don't want to tackle complex uh, forecasting methods, you can get away with relatively simple methods and they tend to already perform um, quite well. And on the plus side, you know, if you if you do forecasting well, right, there's tremendous benefits to it. Um, the better you forecast, in some sense, the less firefighting there is in your organization and your supply chains. Um, you know, you you of course get immediate benefits such as higher service levels, lower safety stock requirements, overall less friction in operations. But I think um, maybe the two most important things, if you do forecasting and sort of the related sales and operations planning right. Um, it's ultimately th the key aspects over here are organizational aspects. It's difficult to do, but once you do it right, uh, it's hard to copy. I think it's it's quite a competitive advantage. And, um, you know, uh, overall, it allows your organization to really focus on the things that drive value, right? Bad forecasting leads to a lot of frictions that remove your attention from what really matters to just kind of firefighting and and things like that. So forecasting, I think, is incredibly necessary um, for creating any kind of predictable and um, stable operations. Next slide. Uh, all right, so generating the, the forecast to inform the decision that Eno discussed in the previous slide uh, is a uh, is typically uh, iterative process that requires um, several steps that are highlighted in this flowchart. So this uh, forecasting workflow always starts with identifying a decision that requires a forecast. This uh, this seems obvious, but sometimes actually we forget about this and uh, we are too enthusiastic and we rush into the model building without understanding really. Why we do the why we produce the forecast in the first place, um, uh, and then uh, we generate the forecast, and we don't know how to use it later. So I think it is really important to spend some good time in this first step to identify decisions. Um, typically, we have one or many probably reasons or decisions that require the forecast. So uh, we need to identify them first, and then following that, uh, basically what we identify in step one. Uh, help us to determine the forecasting requirements, which generally includes what is the the thing that you want to forecast, for how long in advance you want to forecast it, what is the granularity that you need in terms of temporal granularity, but also cross-sectional granularity, uh, what is the frequency of producing the forecast, how often uh, you need to produce the forecast, and so on. Uh, so in Following that, in step, uh, step three, we uh, talk about gathering data information. And here, uh, we typically talk about four uh, type of data. First of all, we have um, past historical data for the variable that you want to forecast. And then we talk about also the past and future value of deterministic predictors. So these are predictors, they value are known in advance like promotion or um, public holidays. And the third type of data is what we call um, stochastic predictors. So these, again, we need the past and future values of them, depending on, again, how we use them. But these are predictors, their future value are not known, and you may need to estimate them. And finally, we also uh, need the collective expertise or judgment of uh, key people in the organization as well. So once we have the data that we need, um, and typically in any organization, the raw data is never in a format that it is ready for uh, forecasting or anal data analysis in general. So we need first to put it in a format that is uh, required for the analysis, but also we need to check the different aspect of the data quality here as well, including like missing values, duplications, the accuracy of the values and, and so on. Uh, and following that, we uh, uh, provide different sort of uh, plots or data visualization, but this is step four and five, they're sometimes happening actually simultaneously because we can also use data visualization 
to check for the quality of data sometimes. But in step five, you are looking for a sort of systematic patterns in our data that could help us to um, build a model. But also, uh, this is where we need uh, maybe domain knowledge to um, understand basically the data. And in step six, we have to uh, choose from like a, a bunch of different forecasting methods. So which method actually we have to use. Um, and again, this depends on many factors. Uh, we could also choose a method from very simple one to go to a more uh, complicated one. Um, and then we'll discuss it actually a bit later in detail. Um, and we following that, we have to train the model on the data and then produce the forecast, which could be in the form of point forecast, prediction intervals, distribution, or the sort of quantiles if you want to extract from the distribution. And then we have to evaluate the quality of the forecast. And here the quality may have different dimension as well, including, of course, forecast accuracy, business impact, but also other aspect of quality like uh, computational time or um, interpretability, for instance. So this sort of steps are, uh, you may go through them multiple times. And uh, following that, when we are happy with this, we can now communicate the forecast to the audience. And here we may ask ourselves two questions. So what we have to communicate, but also in what uh, format we have to communicate it. And typically in the workflow, uh, in the last step, or before maybe communicating with different audience or simultaneously, we have to also um, adjust the forecast sometimes. Uh, this may happen when we have some new information that we didn't have it before producing the forecast, just they came out. Or sometimes you may think that some information are actually missing, so the model didn't capture that information. But again, the question is, if we now know them, we could include them in the model, so why not? Instead of um, uh, adjusting the forecast, why don't we just include them in the model building? Um, so these are basically all the steps we need to go through when it comes to producing the forecast uh, and the repetitive step that we are talking about. We're, we're a big believer in simple examples. And again, that, that's partially because of the audience we're addressing in the book. And um, uh, this is sort of a, an example where um, we introduce forecasting methods in the book and and really sort of we want to make a couple of of important points over here so for example the very first one is um that we um that, that point forecasts by themselves are fairly useless um it's still very common in organizations to just produce point forecasts right but if you do that um you have sort of two problems with it the first problem is um, you create the illusion of certainty where there really is no certainty, right? A forecast is not really uh, a description of exactly what happens. A forecast is an estimation of a probability distribution ultimately. And um, and that has to be communicated, right? If you don't communicate it, um, everybody in the room will, will think, you know, will, will make their own judgments about how certain a forecast actually is, right? And... Um, or some might even think that the forecast is is quite certain, where in fact there's a lot of uncertainty around it, right? So um, you need to think about a forecast really as an estimate of a probability distribution. So if you consider the example here on the right-hand side, it's a um, simple time series, right? If you look at the sort of um, the graph on the upper right-hand side, um, this is a, um, you know, a, a simple random walk and, um, you know, the the first thing that you do is you forecast is if you get a you know if you look at the middle graph right you get the sort of the center line over there that would be a forecast for the future and um this is another key learning i think that we we want to illustrate is a lot of people will think of that that line of forecast right if you have a random walk underlying the data if you have no trend or seasonality um your forecast, your set of forecasts for uh, the next periods 
will essentially be constant. And this is incredibly counterintuitive for people, right? People expect forecasts to vary, but forecasts are ultimately noise reduction tools, right? They should, the, the series of forecasts should look a lot less variable than the series of data that preceded it. Um, so again, this is sort of, I think, a, a key learning for many executives is sometimes a series of forecasts is is just a flat series right and you can see that in the in the middle graph right the the point forecast it's sort of the dotted line in the center that's just um kind of the uh, the sequence of forecasts going forward and then around that of course as i said we need to to produce um measures of uncertainty we have prediction intervals and you can see they start narrower and they widen as you predict further into the future um and again that's a an important aspect about forecasting too, right? The more you predict into the future, the higher is the likelihood that the underlying uh, aspects of your of your data generation kind of change, right? In this case, that the the level of the time series the, of the random walk shifts around, and that increases um, the prediction interval. And on the the lower part of the graph, we added a predictive density, right? Which is um, in some sense, the most complex way of representing uncertainty, um, but that gives you kind of, uh, you know, a very clear um, graph of the underlying distribution, right? So with prediction intervals, you ultimately, um, you kind of have a, it's usually something like a 90th, uh, on a, a, a 90% of the distribution that you cover, right? So you, you end up showing best case and worst case scenarios that aren't really best case and worst case scenarios, right? The, the density can extend that. So if you want to communicate that even further, you can use a predictive density. Um, but again, at the very least, um, communicate prediction intervals, um, make sure that, that executives understand um, that there is uncertainty around forecast and make sure that they understand that point forecasts can sometimes just be a straight line if you don't have any indication that there is trend seasonality or any other causal drivers then that's exactly what a sequence of forecasts of point forecasts will be like bahman great so possibly one of the most important steps when it comes to building a forecasting model set so really work in works in practice is to understand uh, your data and of course here in forecasting we're talking about understanding the time series. So uh, here, for instance, we can use time series uh, graphics like a simple time plot to start with to plot the data. And the idea is, of course, to understand what are the sort of systematic patterns in the data, including trend and seasonality, possibly multiple seasonality. Uh, if there are some um, unusual uh, values, like very high or very low, we need to understand uh, those sort of values. So I would say in, in, in real world, um, it is very rare actually to have a time series that um, that is not affected by different events. And this is where, you know, having the domain knowledge is fundamental. It helps to understand the different sort of uh, events that affect the, the time series observations. And uh, also um, by, by having those information, we can go and collect uh, maybe relevant data that could be helpful in building the model. Um, it is also important to look at uh, data from different perspectives, so or, or using basically different sort of data visualization as well to uh, to understand the data. This is an example of ambulance data, for instance. So in the middle we have a, a time plot uh, of hourly data. So of course we can see some sort of systematic patterns, but also some uh, observation that are very low and very high, possibly related to um, public holidays. Uh, but if we look at this data from another uh, aspect, which is um, illustrated in this plot in the bottom, where we have the hour of the day uh, in x-axis and then different lines corresponding to different day of week, we can see actually something really interesting happens that we couldn't see in the time plot. And this is where, for instance, we see the ambulance demand between midnight and um, early morning for Saturday and Sunday is quite different from the rest of the week. And if you look at the other side of this, it means from like uh, 8 p.m. towards midnight, we see that the demand for Saturday and Friday is uh, again different uh, for that um, you know, uh, hour of the day. So there is an interaction between the different 
day of the week and hour of the day. And also we can see a sort of uh, interesting pattern happens in the daytime. So this highlights how important it is to, uh, to understand uh, the data and also the systematic pattern that may exist that help us to build a model. And of course, if we are dealing with a problem where there is no systematic pattern or at least less systematic pattern, the time series is dominated by randomness or noise, then um, it might be really hard to produce a forecast that would be helpful uh, to inform decision making. All right, so now we've seen everything that's important about data and the key issue here is that data is often of uh, doubtful and dubious quality. And so honestly, data quality is hugely important in forecasting and that is sometimes not uh, appreciated quite as much as it might be. And by data, we mean both the focal time series you want to forecast, if there is a focal, if there is a time series, if we want to forecast a cold start, a new product, and we don't have a time series, but then we have predecessor products or similar products, so their quality is important. And on the other hand, it's also any causal drivers. So if we have a promotion or something, already mentioned that one, uh, then it's important to know when past promotions happened, what kind of promotions they were, what their features were, and when they are going to recur in the future. Because if we just know there were promotions at some point in the past, but we don't know anything else, and uh, we are we have a problem, essentially. And so, honestly, in our experience, uh, it's often the case that better data and better understood data is often more important than fancy modeling. And uh, that's possibly not uh, the impression you'd get from academic research and forecasting where people will take a data set that they got somewhere and they'll just assume the data as given and their understanding of the data as given and then they'll start doing the fancy modeling. Well, very often you just see that if you are able to get a better grip on the data itself, then you can improve on many of the more complex methods. Okay, so how do we understand our data better? Well, that's always a question of having the domain knowledge, so understanding where the data comes from. Uh, what we just saw was, was ambulance data, so it's it's important to understand what happens at, in the UK on Friday evening, on Saturday evening, that might cause uh, more calls for an ambulance, so there's domain knowledge for you. And that also tells you what to look for, what's going to be important, what kind of data is probably, what kind of causal drivers are probably driving our time series. So that's what you need to look for. That's how you understand what may be a problem, a problem in your data. And that will help you understand uh, where and when to look for problems and how to solve those problems. If you have problems and uh, how do you deal with those problems, um, you can always try imputing missing data. I personally am not a big fan of imputing data, data imputation, because it kind of simulates knowledge and understanding and certainty that we actually don't have. So if there is um, anything that's problematic, then you can try to correct it or again impute it. Or you might also be, it might be possible to just use a different predictor and say, we are not sure about this data point. So mark it in a causal way and let the model um, figure out how to deal with that. Can you skip to the next slide, please, Rahman? Thank you. All right, so now we've got data, or we all hope that we have good data. Now we are ready to start building method and models and figuring out methods using forecasting. Uh, here's just a very simple plot that kind of conceptually gives you the the trade-off uh, between Bachmann, could you please be so kind to turn off your, your mic? Thank you so much. Lovely, thank you. Uh, it gives you a bit of a trade-off between model complexity and interpretability. And complexity doesn't necessarily mean that more complex methods are more accurate, but it just means that they're more complex. And we start looking at the top left at things like the seasonal mean. So just take the historical time series, take the overall historical mean, and just forecast that out as a flat line. Or a naive forecast, take the last uh, data point and forecast that out. A seasonal naive, take the last data point from the same season and forecast that out. So if you want to forecast the next January, then just take the last January observation and forecast that out, or take the average of the of all the historical January observations and use that as a forecast for next January. It's extremely simple and often works surprisingly well and is very hard to beat by more complex methods, especially if your input data is iffy. Well, beyond and that should always be used. No, 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 don't, 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 don't go ahead. 
<laughs> Thank you. Sorry. OK, so when, once we have that, we can start looking at more complex methods uh, like exponential smoothing, ARIMA, Croston's method for uh, for for intermittent demands. Those are also workhorses for forecasters and everybody knows them. And that's the first thing you learn about in forecasting. And they're they're available in so many different uh, implementations and for any software that you might care to use. And those still can't co model causal effects or predictors. So for those, we need things like multiple linear regression, which is still simple. And many people have come across a regression, at least in their college days. And beyond that, you go into the more modern, more complex methods like tree-based methods, random forest boosting, and then neural networks and deep learning. And there's so many different architectures and methods for all these things, especially for deep learning. Now you can combine them and use boosting with deep learning, and you can combine things using meta learners. And you can do lots of things. They're less interpretable. They usually take a much longer time to fit. Uh, they're more expensive in terms of you may need to really hire cloud services to actually run to fit those models. You might may need to hire uh, expensive data scientists, and perhaps some of those expensive data scientists are in this call here. And uh, you have to pay for those people to fit those more complex methods, whereas a simple historical mean, you can do that in Excel or SQL or what have you, and that's actually pretty simple and pretty cheap. And of course, uh, on top of all this, we always have human judgment. Humans will always uh, adjust the forecasts if they get the chance to do so. Sometimes it makes sense, sometimes it makes less sense. Bahan, can you click please? Thank you so much. So how do we deal with all these different models? What's, what's a good workflow for actually building forecasting models? And here's something you would propose. We always recommend starting with the simple methods like, as we said, historical mean, historical quantiles, last observations, that's a naive forecast. They're very simple to build, they're very fast, and they should always serve as a benchmark. If you can't improve on the simple mean, then building something more complex is just a waste of everybody's time and processing cycles, both human and uh, computer processing cycles. Once you've built that, a logical next step is exponential smoothing or RIMA. They're implemented, there are established tools for those like forecast fail or a smooth package in, in R, the last one built by, by our very own Ivan Svetonkov. Uh, it's, uh, I often see questions on cross-validated, which is like a QA site for statistics on how to build a model based on autocorrelation or partial autocorrelation plots. And honestly, I'm mystified by why people would do that, because there is so many established methods that will do that very well for you. And unless you're really an expert in these methodologies, you should really not try to do that. The, the established methods will outperform you and they will be faster. So just don't do it by yourself. And especially don't follow random internet advice because there's so much random stuff on the internet where people just build some kind of post somewhere where they start tea leaves reading in autocorrelation, partial autocorrelation functions, and they give some kind of advice and you're more confused afterwards than, than before. So best to really just use an automatic method unless you know what you're doing. Uh, then beyond that, uh, if you have predictors, then, uh, then you should really look at causal methods like regression, which is very simple. It's linear, so it's kind of constrained. It's not very flexible, but that may just be uh, what you need because you should start with a simple method first and make that run. Uh, once you're done with that, look for the more complex ones. Always be guided by domain knowledge and start with the more important drivers first and also in terms of data quality and forecastability. So if you have a hugely important driver, but you can't forecast that, if you know your sales are driven by the weather, but you need a forecast for three months ahead and you don't know the weather three months ahead, all you know is the climatology or the seasons that you have, then you probably can't really use the weather in forecasting very well. You may need it uh, in cleansing your past data or in fitting your past data, but in forecasting, it's probably not going to be very useful. So use something else. Well, always need to come to balance the effort in data collection against the improvement in accuracy. If you spend a lot of time collecting data, cleansing data, understanding data, and just get a tiny improvement in accuracy, the question really is, is that worth your while? 
And always be aware of overfitting. It's always tempting to start fitting more and more complex methods and putting in more and more data and seeing nicer and nicer in sample fits, but the out of sample fits at some point will not get better because you're starting to overfit. So be careful about that. Um, beyond that, um, we can you can always look at combinations. So combinations is always a very good tool. So that's just an empirical fact that combinations often outperform the various com constituents methods or trying to select the single best method. So picking the best method uh, for any time series that is a commonly used strategy. It's often better to just not do that, just use everything, combine everything weightedly or unweightedly. Uh, in interestingly enough, it's often the case that an unweighted combination is very hard to beat by finding an optimal combination, so setting optimal weights, and that's been referred to by the forecast combination puzzle. So here's our recommendation. Start with a very simple method, go on to time series method, look at causal methods and always consider combinations and always keep it simple because you can spend a lot of time running down rabbit holes and uh, and doing lots of important stuff and interesting stuff without necessarily getting better forecasts out of that. Bahman, can you click please? Thank you so much. All right, so here's one thing that's actually very dear to my heart, uh, that's forecast quality evaluation. So now we have our forecast and how do we find out whether that's any good? And the problem here is that there's so many things to do here because there is an entire zoo of forecast accuracy measures, depending on what you're forecasting. For point forecasts, you can have a squared loss, you can have an absolute error, you can have a percentage error. Even if you have a, an interval forecast, a quantile forecast, so you want to forecast like a, a value so that yeah, you're reasonably sure that uh, no more than 90% of your observations are below that value. Why would you want to do that? Well, because that may be your order up to level. If you order up to this level, then you'll cover 90% of demand. So that's an interval forecast. You need to evaluate that. There's pinball losses. And I'll evaluate a quantile forecast using a squared loss, but a pinball loss, that's built for that. If you have an inter interval forecast, then you can have an interval score. If you have an inter predictive density, then you can look to proper scoring rules. And these are actually in descending order of interpretability because at some point in time, proper scoring rules, really, I don't think anybody understands those. I certainly don't. But they're there to help you evaluate density forecasts. The problem is, especially point forecasts can be actively misleading. So if you the mean absolute percentage errors, for instance, is undefined if you have an, a zero in your actual time series because you'd then be dividing by zero. Uh, your maths are not going to like that. And if you have an intermittent or low volume count data time series and the mean absolute error can be very misleading, it might lead you or incentivize you to give an, an output that is not the expectation that is highly biased. So if you have something that has lots of zeros, it might be best, best in scare quotes, if you have the absolute error. Uh, the absolute error could be minimized by a flat zero forecast. That's uh, rather unintuitive. And uh, that's why I'm always, it's always um, important to really think about your, your time series and what you're trying to do. It's always better to figure out what do I want to get out of my time series? Do I want an expectation forecast? Do I want a quantile forecast? And tailor the forecast accuracy measure to what you want out of your forecast and then work. And very often we see it the other way around. People take a time series, they just take any old forecast accuracy measure because it looks nice like the mean absolute percentage area, and then they forecast out. And, and then they're surprised uh, that an, an, a biased forecast might perform better than an unbiased one. Question we often, often get and often see out there is uh, using external benchmarks. So here there's people out there that will sell you uh, external benchmarks, industry standards. Uh, in your industry, the standard error is 30%. So if you only achieve 40%, you need to hire expensive consultants to get a better forecast. Um, honestly, those benchmarks, those accuracies, those industry standards are really meaningless because it hugely depends on what a granularity you, for, you forecast on. If you forecast on uh, per SKU level, that's going to be harder than if you forecast on a category or product group level. If you forecast on a weekly level, it's going to be harder than if you forecast on a monthly level. And most of these indus industry standards don't even tell you which granularity they're thinking of. So it's really hard. 
And in addition, it very much depends on what kind of, of uh, product you're selling. If you sell a staple, a very simple, stable product, if you're selling toilet paper, toilet paper demand is very stable. There is no seasonal. There's essentially nothing happening in there unless you have a pandemic. So your forecast is going to be extremely simple. If you're selling something else like detergent, where you have lots of promotional activities, uh, that's going to be much harder to forecast. So it really depends on what you're forecasting. So you can't just say industry average for, for instance, drugstore products or household products. You could call that household products. It's not going to tell you anything. So better to benchmark your processes and make sure that your forecasting process is as good as it can be. And then good good accuracy is going to fall out at the end of it. And uh, if you have a worse forecast than your competitor down the road, then that might just be a case of you may not have the best forecast process, or you may just have time series of products that are harder to forecast. And it doesn't make a lot of sense to just say, well, they've got better forecasts, so we have to do something. We have to fire our people, hire more intelligent people, hire more creden credential people to get a better forecast they may not be able to improve on your particular time series to work on. And finally, even if you can improve your forecast accuracy, that does not necessarily mean that you get better business outcomes because forecast accuracy is nice to have, but you can't buy anything out of a lower MAPE or a lower mean squared error. You can't buy something if you have a better inventory position, if you have a higher service level, if you have lower inventories, that's something that can earn or save you money. Better forecast accuracy will not earn you any money. And the link between accuracy and business outcome, that's not quite straightforward because business outcome not only depends on the accuracy of the forecast, for, the forecast is hugely important, but there are so many other things that also tie in here. And it's all the supply chain parameters from logistical units to uh, replenishment cycles to the quality of your suppliers and so on and so forth. And all these uh, get in and all those are, are hugely important too, and they may swamp the accuracy. Bahman, one more click, please. Thank you so much. There's also a human aspect. So we've been talking a lot about models and methods and MAPES and uh, numbers and theory and abstractness, but it's in the end, it's all humans that do the forecasting. We've started at the very beginning uh, talking about judgmental adjustments and judgmental impacts on forecasting. And we have an entire chapter in the book on uh, how to deal with the forecast or with a human forecast in the loop. So what's the perfect forecast? So what should you be looking for when you want to hire a forecasting team? And there's tons of Venn diagrams of data scientists floating around out there. And our personal one uh, really consists of four dimensions. So there is um, uh, programming, of course. Every data scientist needs to understand programming, whether it's Python, SQL, whatever, whatever you want to use. You also need to understand statistics. Uh, you need to understand randomness, variation. You need to understand uh, linear regression. You need to understand lots of things there. And then the uh, third one is always business or domain knowledge. So understanding the domain knowledge. If you don't understand the domain, then you will have a hard time figuring out which is the time, which are the data points, the data that you need, which are the predictors that are important. And the fourth dimension, which is quite as important as the other three, is communication. Because you need communication at the very beginning of that flow chart that we talked about in talking to business people, what kind of forecasts you need, what is the decision you want to you want to, uh, to, to use your forecasts for, uh, what kind of data do you have, what's, this, what's the environment, what are we talking about, that's where you need communication. And you also need communication at the very end. The forecaster just built their wonderful, lovely forecast, and now he has to explain that to the people that will consume it, that will actually decide based on the forecast. And the forecaster needs to build trust in the forecast because if the business people do not trust the forecast, they'll disregard it and they'll just use their own forecasts or their own gut feeling or anything. And then typically that's not a good outcome for anybody involved. So communication in forecasting is hugely important. And somebody who is a whiz at statistics and programming and understands the domain knowledge but can't explain their forecasts to somebody else, they're not going to be very useful. All right, thank you very much. I think next is on to somebody else. That's NO. Thank you. Back to me again. I always have to follow up with your four dimensional Venn diagram, Stefan, and I cannot. So thank you so much. And then, uh, as I 
tell everybody for the next version of the book, we'll make it five dimensional. Um, all right, so I think sort of um, one thing which is very dear to my heart is to to always um, think of forecasting not just as a technical and statistical process, but ultimately as a as a human process, right? Uh, forecasting is embedded into the organization. It is um, subject to individual biases and it's, it's sub subject to the sociological biases that are are inherent in organizations, right? So um, there's there's plenty of of um, companies where um, the forecast is ultimately uh, a judgmental one, right? Um, most firms like a, a statistical forecast is is a baseline, uh, but it is then adjusted by decision makers. And um, it's amazing how prevalent that still is. And sometimes for good reasons, sometimes for not good, so good reason. Um, you know, um, Paul Goodwin and, and Robert Files and um, Sherry Debates just have you know, put out a working paper where they integrated sort of what do we know about um, judgmental adjustments? And the answer is basically they improve accuracy in only 52% of the time. So that's a that's a pretty low number. And um, and really the reason here are why that's not more effective, right, is, is sort of twofold. One is um, individual biases and the other one is sort of organizational biases, right? So individual biases are are really, um, you know, what we know about human judgment and decision making, right? So there are things like anchoring and recency. So uh, as human decision makers, we are very clearly anchored on more recent outcomes rather than past outcomes. And that actually, again, if you have a, a time series that changes quite a bit, um, that's not necessarily a bad thing, right? That's exactly what what techniques like exponential smoothing are doing is that they're basically anchored on on recent outcomes. But if you have relatively stable time series where the patterns don't change that much, then that creates um, an anchoring on on recent observations, which is can be very biasing. Uh, the second bias I mentioned over here is representativeness, and I, to some degree I mentioned this earlier. Um, if you ask people to basically forecast a time series, you give them time series data and you ask them to forecast the next points, they act like as if they're simulating the time series. They expect that the sequence of forecasts should look like what they see in the sequence of data, right? And as we discussed before, that's really not the case. Forecasting is, a, uh, is, is ultimately about noise reduction, right? Um, People see patterns in randomness. If you give people random walk data, they will inevitably say, oh, there's a trend here, uh, where really all they're picking up is that random walk randomly walked into the same direction for three periods in a row, which happens fairly frequently in a random walk. So people see patterns in randomness, and they also tend to be over precise, right? If, they, uh, if you ask for judgmental, uh, prediction intervals, they tend to be narrower than the true predict prediction intervals. So those are kind of individual biases, um, but there's also organizational biases, right? The, the um, forecast is um, a coordinating tool across many different functional areas uh, that all want to influence each other through the forecast, right? So um, I think most organizations have moved away from, you know, asking salespeople for forecasts, but uh, that was a common practice just kind of 10 to 20 years ago, right? And then it leads to all kinds of biases where, you know, salespeople might either think that, oh, my my goal is going to, my sales targets are going to depend on the forecast. So if I lowball the forecast, I'm going to get lower targets that are easier to accomplish. Or they're going to think, well, um, the forecast is going to drive the production quantities that operations is going to put in place. I want more stuff to sell, so I'm going to increase the forecast so that you know um, production quantities are higher and I can sell more stuff, right? So, so those are sort of typical um, organizational incentives, and um, you know uh, there are plenty of of so the forecasting process is ultimately a political process, uh, which is why you know. We, we have things like sales and operations planning processes in place that try to rationalize this um, and really, uh, but ultimately um, 
again, I think every forecaster needs to be aware um, that the forecast can be influenced by um, organizational politics. Next slide. Batman, you are muted. And also, if we want to take some questions, uh, give it a bit of time. Sure. Yeah. So uh, I think, yeah, the so uh, most of us in this call, we have been doing probably forecasting and we know that sometimes it is actually easy to become frustrated because um, the forecast we produce doesn't probably match the reality as we, we think it should. And uh, um, and then, um, so the forecasting process seemed to fail, really. So in actually one of the last chapters of the book, we discussed this specific topic and uh, we discussed what failure means in the context of forecasting. So here I um, present a simple uh, time plot. So in the y-axis, we have the demand for a service. In the x-axis, we have the month. And so the black line is the actual, um, which seems to be actually quite consistent. So there are consistent patterns. In the, in the historical time series, and the forecast is produced for 48 months. Now, so the blue line is the point forecast, then 80%, 95% prediction intervals, and many other um, different possible futures there. And then, of course, most of us, we know something um, uh, happened here. We had COVID-19, um, and then uh, it, it would be interesting to see actually uh, what uh, the how the model performs when it comes to this, and it is pretty obvious that um, after COVID, um, the demand for this service was almost zero. The model actually was doing pretty a pretty good job up to here, as we can see, but then it continues to do the same thing because it assumes that the, uh, the features or patterns observed in the past will be observed in the future as well, but that was not the case. So that basically this is an example of failure. So in the book we discuss Different aspect of it, uh, we discuss actually we don't have any other alternative to forecasting, so we have to make decision and plan based on that. So that's why we need actually to do the forecast. So that's why the forecast doesn't really fail, but we need to understand probably different aspect of it. Um, if you are dealing with, um, let's say, uh, a variable that is um, uh, dominated by noise, so well, it is likely that you can get something that is accurate. If you make decisions only based on the point forecast, ignoring uncertainty, again, um, this might not be very helpful. Um, and uh, well, uh, the, the rest of it. So um, I think as Ivan said, uh, maybe uh, I will stop here and we can take some questions and go if you want to buy the book as well, there is a discount that you can use um, uh, to buy the physical copy of the book. Great, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks for managing to put so much information in such a short uh, presentation. We have actually several questions in the chat. Actually, actually in fact, we I see that several people are discussing that already on their own. But it would be nice, you know, to bring some of those questions um, to the wider audience. So the first was uh, a question from Sven. Where would you place human judgment with regard to interpretability and complexity? I've seen that Enno has already replied something, but it would be interesting to hear each one of you uh, if you have something to say about that. Um, who wants, maybe Enno, you can vocalize <laughs> what you've written and then we'll move to the Yeah, next. I mean, it's, it's sort of, that, that depends, right? I mean, um, if, if human judgment in an organization is really just like, okay, everybody's free for all, adjust the forecast as you will without providing any reasons, then it's, um, you know, neither interpretable nor particularly simple. Um, so, but you can, you can set up a process for this, right? Um, so I'm a big fan of, you know, in some sense, not having people adjust the forecast, but having people just provide reasons of why the forecast might be wrong, right? So classic example is, hey, we have scheduled a promotion and I don't think the forecast reflects the promotion. Well, that's important information. I mean, first of all, that should be a feedback to your data scientist that says, why does the forecast not include a promotion that we've scheduled, right? And second of all, well, that's a fairly straightforward adjustment that um, 
you know, once you know that there's a promotion scheduled, you can estimate what that means and have an algorithm basically do the adjustment. So I'm a big fan of just having people basically point out the incompleteness in models and um, you can set up a process for that. That is both in very interpretable and not complex at all. And I think really quite effective. Thank you, Anna. Bachmann, Stefan, do you have anything to, to add? When it comes to judgmental ad adjustments, uh, sorry, I, I was answering a different question in the chat. <laughs> Are we talking about just different judgmental adjustments, aren't we? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So from my from our experience, it's it's often all also a case of uh, people trusting the system more. So what we've seen is when we implement our solution at a customer, then the amount of the number of judgmental adjustment really goes down over time. Uh, that may reflect perhaps the system is getting better because the data are getting better and the the the, the entire process is is kind of getting smoother and smoother. Or uh, what I like to think is that people learn to trust the system more and more. So it's it's also it's really a question is is there somebody who's feeling uh, their their personal identity lies in forecasting then they'll have an, an issue if a like a machine comes over and, and takes over or is there somebody else whose whose identity is something else is perhaps getting the supply chain to run smoothly and forecasting is something they had to do on the side or as a as a means to an end people like those will be happier to let the machine take over and they'll not feel so invested and not feel uh, the, the compulsion to really change matters. So it's really a question of the process that you're putting the forecast in and about the people that are in there. OK, thanks. Right. Uh, well, if uh, you don't have anything to add, Bachmann, then I'll move to the next question. I think, uh, sorry, just one, one thing that maybe it is yep. relevant here is the sort of like a decision making process that follows the forecast. So. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's a, it's a, if you have an automatic decision making process there in place, so maybe there is less than actually judge, uh, adjusting the forecast itself. It goes maybe to the decision. It could be sometimes the case. Uh, but uh, again, again, in, in many cases that I came across as well, the decision making is manual and uh, the, the forecast judgment happens. And I think Eno and uh, Stefan, they cover it both. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, thanks a lot. Uh, there is a question related to one of the very hypey topic, recent ones. Uh, so what is your take on conformal prediction intervals? I'll, I'll phrase the question like that. Uh, perhaps uh, I already, already gave a little answer in there, so uh, I personally don't understand it yet. Uh, I hope we'll understand it at some point in time because we really need to include it in the book because it's all the rage nowadays. Uh, just Googling for it gives you a commentary by Tim Yonoshovsky on the M5 competition where he essentially says in a throwaway remark that most of the top scorers on the M5 competition use conformal prediction intervals, which he said was pretty much just just uh, bootstrapping or resampling in sample residuals. So that's nice. Uh, it's but it's not really completely rocket science. It would not be the first uh, the first time that something that's not completely that's not a huge advance would be hyped by by lots of people who think it's it's wonderful. My personal question always is I'm, I'm always very concerned about uh, not only differences in the mean but also differences in the variance so with forecasts need to be to take account of heteroscedasticity because sometimes you know that your your quantiles should be farther away from the mean and sometimes less far because you have different uh, variances in the process you're forecasting I'm always a bit concerned about whether conformal prediction intervals can deal with that apparently there are newer methods and approaches that can deal with that it's just that yeah we need to understand that a little more a little better but honestly i haven't seen anybody in the m5 competition who trumpeted that they were using conformal prediction and that made the difference and so I'm not quite sure whether that's because there were no libraries at that point or because uh, the Kaggle community was not aware of that. So it's it bears watching. OK. Uh, and uh, Bachmann, do you have anything to add to this? No? OK. 
Uh, well, we are running out of time, so I'll actually pick a random question <laughs> from the chat as the final one. Any suggestions for a priori for costability measures? I think, and uh, this is more of a question to you because you mentioned for costability in, in the chat. So can you comment? Actually, I gave an answer to that. Uh, perhaps I can just read my answer. Please Coefficient of variation or anything else is pretty much useless. And I personally always say the proof of the pudding is in the eating and the proof of the forecast is in the quality. Uh, so it's very hard to assess forecastability ahead of time because you don't know what you don't know. And if somebody else knows something that you don't know, then they might be much they might find a, a time series much easier to forecast than somebody than you might be. So forecastability is never a, a function of the for time series itself. It's always a function of the information set of the knowledge of the forecaster. So given a certain amount of knowledge, this time series is easier or harder to forecast. So and that ties back into understanding your data, which we talked about at the very beginning. Uh, if you can expand your knowledge, your information set about the time series, then a four time series become suddenly may become much more easily forecastable. And that's very hard to say in general. Just uh, just add to what Stefan said. I think well, in general, uh, coefficient of variation or entropy might be used to say what is the ratio of signal to noise or something like that. But uh, I agree with Stefan. Uh, so most of the time, actually, these measures, they just look at the time series itself, but uh, there are a lot of other things that affect the time series. If you spend time, understand what are actually those driving factors, those events, and you collect the data for it, uh, that uh, time series that maybe the coefficient of variation or entropy told you, it is difficult to forecast. Actually, it becomes really maybe easy to forecast. So I think mm -hmm. that's the domain knowledge collecting relevant uh, predictors and in building the, in the model, I think, is, is the key there. Okay. Uh, I think a lot of it has to do with understanding the market structure, right? If you're predicting the behavior of very few, very large customers that place huge orders, then you can have a lot of unpredictability in the market, right? Versus if you, at an aggregate level, have many small customers and you have a high level of aggregation and, and that's much easier in some sense to predict. So sort of understanding your market structure is maybe the, the first way of, of um, categorizing forecastability. Of course, in general scale, right? Uh, do you predict sort of slow moving items where you just have like zeros and ones throughout the year? Or do you have something that is that that moves kind of faster, which again is, is related to market structure. So I think for me, understanding the customer base and the level of aggregation that you want to predict is probably key in terms of understanding forecastability. Right, well, uh, using my own power, I'll ask you a bonus question, but it will be a very small one. Uh, how can you handle pressure to make the forecast the same as the strategic plan? That's the question from Caroline. And I'll use my superpower. Mm -hmm. I already answered that one. <laughs> yeah, in the book, we, we pay very much attention to the difference between a forecast, a plan, and a target. A forecast is what we expect the future to be like. That's our expectation based on our actions, of course. Uh, the, the target is what we want to achieve, and we tailor our actions to reaching that target. And the plan is what we plan for, is the decisions we make to, to address the future that will come along. And there is a difference here. And of course, educating people is easier said than done. I see that every day when I try to educate my children. And that's, again, a point where communication comes in. That's the short answer because we're running out of time. Great. I think we can finish. Uh finish now. Thanks a lot for the presentation. Thank you everyone for your questions. The chat was very, very lively uh, this time. So we will have another um, event, another webinar next month in November. So, so stay tuned. And once again, thank you, Bachmann, Enno and uh, Stefan. And see you around. Thank, thank you, everybody. It's been a wonderful time. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye bye.